deep, clearly. You should be able to hear me at the back. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we do at Singularity University. If you have any questions, ask, because I'll be going through this uh, in, a, in a, uh, a, a little while. I'm going to talk through this in uh, three sections. The first is what, what is SU all about? What is Singularity University? The second is some of the major breakthroughs that we see happening. Um, and the third section is really how do I think about where this is going and what kinds of applications that we see. Um, so the, the whole idea behind Singularity University is that technology, and specifically computing, is getting smaller, cheaper, faster, better. Okay? So 10 years ago, we had in this $1,000 laptop the equivalent uh, computing power of one insect brain. Um, today, we have the equivalent of the brain of one mouse in this laptop. In 12 years, we'll have the equivalent computing power of one human being. And in about 30 or 40 years, Oh, it's broken the thing, unfortunately. Should I just hold it? Maybe I just hold it. Okay, no problem. So, and in, uh, so in, uh, today we have the brain of a mouse. Uh, in 10 years, we'll have the, the equivalent of one human being, the brain processing power. And in 30 or 40 years, all human beings uh, in the world in that $1,000 laptop in, the, in terms of the brain power. And the question is, what would we do with it? And there's a viewpoint there's a, uh, an opinion that it's very difficult to predict where technology is going. And we think that's wrong. Um, because if I look at this, my, my phone, I know exactly how many computing cycles this will have in three years, five years, or ten years. What we, I lack, what we lack is the imagination as to what we would do with it. And what you should have is the imagination as to how to use that. Right? So essentially, but we base and gear around this basic idea. So this was founded by um, Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamandis. Now, uh, Ray has, has created many inventions. He created the Kurzweil synthesizer, and digital music came from that, uh, flatbed scanning, optical character recognition, text-to-speech for the blind, etc. And he's created many in, uh, inventions. And he started trying to time, when you, when you launch a successful invention, a, a large part of the success has to do with the timing in the marketplace. If the, if the invention is too early to the marketplace, you will fail. And often you will see technologies come to the market. The Apple Newton was an example. It was too early. You, you may not be old enough to remember the Apple Newton. But uh, it came too early to the market and it failed. Right? The iPad or the iPhone hit the market at the right time. So he started trying to predict where technology was going. Now, how many of you are familiar with Moore's Law? Many of you? Some of you? Okay. So Gordon Moore, who was the head of Intel in the 60s, made a prediction that computing power would double every 18 months. And, and since the 1960s, that prediction has held incredibly accurately. And Ray was fascinated by this, and he started tracking and graphing this. And he went back 100 years. You can't see this, but this is 1900 all the way to 2010. The, the, the computing price performance has gone on a logarithmic doubling pattern very steadily for 60 years. And what was very surprising to him was, why is this curve so smooth? Any stock market goes up and down. We have wars. We have recessions. We have ups and downs in the semiconductor industry. Yet the price performance of computing is incredibly steady. And he came up with the fundamental insight, probably the most important thing that we have realized at Singularity University, which is that any time anytime an information any time a discipline or a subject area becomes information enabled and starts being powered by information properties, it goes into this exponential doubling pattern. Okay? So for example, now that we have sequenced the human genome, medicine is essentially powered by information properties. And the price performance of gene sequencing in medicine is going exponentially upwards. Right? So as we are enabling more and more of our lives by, and digitizing more and more of our lives. All of those aspects are being powered by information properties and going into this doubling pattern. So for example, Facebook has, has allowed us to digitize our relationships. Our relationships are now information-based. 
not analog communications, right? So that's Ray. Um, Peter is a, is a different animal. Um, I've started a few companies. Uh, Peter has uh, thinks about how do you shift and change entire industries. So he created the XPRIZE Foundation, which offers large public prizes to change industries. Okay? And essentially, this was a, a combination of their two ideas. Uh, and really, Peter has been the driving force behind the creation of Singularity University. So two years ago, there was a founding conference um, where they brought together 50 or 60 thought leaders from around Silicon Valley and said, we're thinking of creating this new university. What do you think? Um, some of the people here, this is Ray and Peter. This is Pete Warden. We're based at NASA Ames. There are 10 NASA centers around, the, uh, around America. And uh, NASA Ames, which is in Silicon Valley, is where they do all of the R&D and all of the supercomputing. So we have the world's, I think, the second fastest supercomputer in the world that we get to play with. Um, so there's some uh, people here. This is uh, George Smoot, who's a Nobel Prize winner in physics. This is uh, Chris Anderson from Wired Magazine. This is me. This is Larry Page, the co-founder of Google behind me, uh, et cetera. And so a very interesting group of people. We spent a day thinking about what it would be like here. And there were two big ideas that came out of this. The first was uh, Larry Page said, look, if you're, if you're focusing on these very fast-moving technologies, and the idea was to bring the smartest people in the world in these areas together, then he said, bring the, focus on the biggest problems. We don't have enough smart, thoughtful people thinking about the biggest problems in the world. And so that was his recommendation. The second was uh, the observation that if you look at some of our grand challenges globally, the financial crisis or swine flu and pandemics or climate change, many of these global issues are rooted in accelerating factors right, and exponential factors. The spread of a pandemic is exponential. It doubles every time you interact with more people. Now, our leadership in the world does not understand this phenomenon, business or political. This fundamental idea of doubling is not something that's intuitive to human beings. We are biologically geared to seeing a bird in the sky and linearly extrapolating where it will be. We are not geared towards thinking in this doubling pattern. It's not intuitive. Right? So if I take 30 steps linearly, I will get to the other room. If I take 30 steps and I double every time, I'll get to California. Right? Very big difference. And yet, as we're information enabling the world, the world is operating more and more in this doubling pattern. Okay? Nobody believed 10 years ago that we would have 5 billion cell phones in the world. And yet, that pattern is operating. So the idea was that if our global challenges are operating in this pace, in this way, our solutions to those challenges need also to be in that pattern. So we, our aim is to find the next generation of leaders in the world. Some of you sitting in this room, for example. Teach them how do you think about this pattern of doubling? Where is technology going? And then how would you leverage and harness these technologies to address global issues? And the reason we focus on, on these uh, technologies, and I'll just name which ones there are, the core technologies that we see that are moving very fast are AI and robotics, medicine, nanotech, biotech, energy, and computing, all powered by computing. Okay? And because these technologies are all naturally scaling and doubling, they can scale to a global level. Okay? Now, what we do is we, if, uh, if you think about most of the world is operating in a linear way and some aspects of the world are operating in an exponential way, that creates a lot of disruption and a lot of stress, but also a lot of opportunity, right? And we study that gap. How do you go from here to here? And a, an exponential curve looks linear early in its life cycle until it hits the, the power curve, right? Is everybody understanding me okay? Am I speaking too fast, too slow? You get it? Okay. All right, so we do two programs. The heart of it is this graduate studies program for 10 weeks every summer. We focus on these areas. These are the areas that I mentioned that are uh, all doubling in their price performance anywhere from 18 to 25 months or so. So the price performance of computing is doubling every 18 months. Solar energy today, for example, has just hit that knee of the curve. And solar energy today is doubling every 22 months in its price performance. Right? Now, while 
it is only 0.1 or 0.12 percent of the global energy supply. It's doubling every 22 months. And so there's promise that it could actually scale to a very global level if we can get the manufacturing correct. It has now hit that information cycle. Um, so we study these areas as how would you apply these technologies. These are the core technologies, and these we think about how would you forecast where it's going, what legal or ethical issues might you run into, how would you fund a new idea. Right? For example, many of you are familiar with 3D printing, right? Okay. Well, stem cell researchers are now using 3D printers and spraying layers of cells and fabricating human organs. Are you familiar with that? Okay. Kidneys, etc. Yeah. So now that has that one development will completely change medicine. Right? It has huge ethical issues, legal issues. How would you regulate something like that? What happens if somebody hacks it? Right? Um, so there's lots of questions. And we don't have an issue, we don't have an answer for this. Um, so one of the things we think about a lot at SU is how does a regulatory framework manage when technology is accelerating away from it? Okay, we've already lost control of the digital music and the whole DRM battle. It's a disaster. The patent system and intellectual property system is essentially not working. Um, privacy is washing away in front of our eyes. So how does the world cope when these technologies are moving so quickly? And, and we're seeing that in the Middle East and Egypt all around you today, right? So we think about that a lot. So in each of those areas, we have uh, a set of global advisors, uh, Vince Cerf, who invented the Internet, uh, Will Wright, who created Spore and SimCity, uh, about 60 of these global advisors, and then a, 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 an expert in each of those areas who helps orchestrate the curriculum and think about what aspects of biotech or nanotech or robotics to focus on. So, for example, Dan Barry at the top, who is our uh, head of faculty, is a three-time space shuttle astronaut, um, is also an MD, PhD, uh, but his real expertise seems to be in robotics. Right? And so Dan comes and spends the entire summer with uh, us. Uh, Ralph Merkel is uh, one of the godfathers of nanotech. Um, John Gage was the chief scientist at Sun Microsystems, etc. So quite a, 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 an amazing group of people. So the students that we look for are uh, graduate students, ideally. Um, we've taken the age range that we've accepted is anywhere from 18 to 45 roughly. Average age is uh, late 20s or so. Uh, top of their field academically, very smart academic thinking, uh, have done something entrepreneurial or leadership oriented, and are interested in, in addressing and solving global challenges. That's, that's our perfect student. Um, we piloted it two years ago with 40 students, uh, and last year we scaled it up to 80 students that come for the summer and live with us for the entire summer. And we had 1,600 applications from 85 countries for those, for those slots. Um, now, the 10 weeks, the summer program looks like this. In the first week, we bring in the World Bank and the Gates Foundation and some of the top uh, nonprofits in the world to talk about what are the characteristics of clean water, home energy, climate change, public health, pandemics, etc. What's been tried, what's failed, uh, what ideas do they have, uh, what might work. So the students have a context and a deep understanding of, of each of those areas. They then spend about half the summer, uh, they get about 300 hours of lectures from 160 different speakers on what is the future of biotech, nanotech, robotics, medicine, computing, AI, etc. What's in the labs today? What's being commercialized tomorrow? Uh, where are these technologies converging? Like the 3D printing and stem cells, for example. Uh, uh, um, what is the three-year, five-year, ten-year outlook? We're different from a traditional university in that we spend about 80% of our curriculum thinking about what might happen in the future. Right? Traditional academics really looks at what's happened in the past. How did this model evolve? How did this equation develop, etc.? Uh, we layer on top of that to think about where will it go. The second half of the summer, the students form teams. And the teams are pivoting around these grand challenges. So there's a water team, there's a team on home, home energy, public health, etc. And the objective, we call this project that they do uh, the 10 to the 9th project. And their objective is come up with a product or service that would impact a billion people within 10 years. Small challenge. Right? Now we're in Silicon Valley, right? So we have to think big. Um, and the idea is that these technologies are all scaling. 
And so we want to blow past any old limits and think about how would you scale these technologies to that level. And if you're going to scale it, then go for a big scale. Right? So I'll give you one example. Uh, one of the teams in the first year looked at the rise of 3D printing and control systems and robotics. And they looked at the housing industry. And they noticed the way we build houses today hasn't changed in, what, 5,000 years. Right? So they devised this system that looks a little bit like a car wash. It's a crane on rails with a nozzle in the middle. And it will 3D print a house in about a day and a half. Okay? A fabricated house. What you should, the photograph is what it's doing with, is to do, it can today do a three meter load bearing wall. And what it does, it lays down thin ribbons of concrete with a weaving pattern in the middle to give it strength. And then you can expand it. If the wall is three meters high, how do they know it's the layer? How do they do the layers? So how, how wide is the layer? The layer is about, this, this is about maybe two inches thick here. Okay. So, they, and now, what this means is the design of a house is now soft, right? It's a model. And you can model it however you want, give it to the printer, and the printer should just print it out. Obviously, this would be very useful in Japan today. Um, and the idea is that you should be able to use concrete or sand if you're in the, here in the Middle East, or uh, adobe if you're in a developing country. Right? So they're building that out. Uh, another example, one of the teams from this last summer they were looking at the clean water problem, and they noticed there was a lecture on synthetic biology, and they noticed a new molecule has been developed. And a side effect of this molecule is that it happens to be very efficient at separating water from salt. Right? It wasn't the intended purpose, but a side effect happens to be that. And they asked the question, could you use that for desalinization? And the lecturer said, I don't know, I've never thought of it. The original purpose was for something else. So they designed a system where you'd have gravity pushing seawater through a filter and then using solar energy to bring it up. Uh, now, I showed, told you that we bring in the World Bank and so on at the beginning of the summer. At the end of the summer, we invite them all back and ask them to comment on some of the solutions. What do they think? What would work? What issues would it have in, in when you try to deploy it? And they tended to agree that this might be the first low-cost uh, desalinization ever. Very, very inexpensive, if, if it can be made to work. Now, something we've noticed is all breakthroughs, all disruptive breakthroughs, always happen when you cross two very different fields together. Right? And so what we're trying to do here is to bring the smartest young students into contact with the fastest moving technologies and point them at the biggest problems. Something interesting is going to happen. Right? That's essentially what we're going to do. So in, the, in last year, we had these five project areas, food, home energy, waste materials, clean water, and space. Uh, the space project was called to boldly stay. We figured out how to boldly go. We've not figured out how to stay in space. So that was the idea behind that. Okay? Um, this is how we sorted through the 1,600 applications. For all the technology, you end up with color coding and sticky dots and paper to try and manage it because uh, creating that class is very difficult. High tech. High tech, very high tech. Yeah. Very complex. Um, and what we're doing with the Ramon Foundation, the, the struggle with building this organization, uh, it's a good problem, but we've had too much demand. Right? We had 1,600 applications this past summer and it took us four months to filter down to 40, 80 students. And my, we have a small team, so doing that is a huge amount of work. And so we did a trial with a Brazilian university and said, we're going to guarantee you one slot. Let's work with you to run a mini X Prize in your local area and run a contest, which is what we're doing this year with uh, Dalit and the Ramon Foundation. And let's find a great student. And so the challenge we gave them was come up with an idea to come, in, to, come to Singularity University for the summer and work on projects to impact a billion people, come up with an idea that might impact a million people around Sao Paulo, and ideally start implementing it. Right? So they ran this for two months, at the end of which we had 230 projects that got created or conceived. Many didn't get implemented, but at least the, the number was there. So we're currently running this in seven countries around the world today. Um, one of the more uh, bizarre aspects of our model is if you think about I was talking to a fellow called Juan Enriquez, who is the, uh, one of the leading thinkers in the world in biotech. And he said that in the last four months, 
they've had six major breakthroughs in biotech. Right? So biotech today is quite different from biotech a year ago. Uh, Ronan came last summer. He's out of date already. He's, 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 you have to go again. Um, and it, what it forces us to do is it means that every year, because we're moving in the very fast-moving technologies, every year we completely redo our curriculum. We re-examine every lecture. We bring our entire faculty together for two weekends in December and March, and we revisit every lecture because biotech today or AI or nanotech or robotics, there's some, things are moving very quickly. Right? So, for example, last year we did some focusing quite a lot on quantum computing. And maybe that's advanced a lot. Maybe it's not expanded very much. Today, maybe we want to put more emphasis on 3D chip design. And so the faculty chooses what areas to really focus on. Now, some of our faculty can't make it, so we have a robot that they can dial into with Skype and drive around if they want to come and hang out. Um, these are the problem spaces we're looking at for this year. Energy, poverty, global health, education, and security. Um, uh, Larry Page uh, gave us our big quote. This is all over our website. Um, he, he's, uh, and he comes and spends time with the <coughs> students. When, uh, when I think Ronan, you saw him on the first day. He came to the, this is from the opening ceremonies from last year. And then we also, that, so the graduate studies program is really focused on the next generation of leadership, right? Uh, your kind of age as you're going to go into the world. We have an executive program that's focused on the existing leadership the uh, CEOs, government leaders. And here we do a one-week program just focused on the core technologies where we spend, give them a half a day on each of those for three days. And the second half of the program, they, they pick their area, their uh, product area or their discipline or their industry, and they think about how would the breakthroughs across all of these technologies impact their agriculture business, their cement business, their technology business, et cetera. And then they present all back to each other. Um, so our aim is to bring in the young leaders from all around the world, give them this education, teach them where technology is going, teach them how to use it constructively and ethically and addressing global challenges and send them back, send them back to their home countries. I came in, I spoke at the State Department in uh, last summer. I met with uh, President Perez a few months ago when I was here in, uh, in Israel. Um, we're the, uh, and we're now advising world governments as to how to think about this, uh, this area. Can you just say how you want to pick up the participants in the executive program? Uh, they apply. What are the ratios? What are the? Ratios. Ratios. Oh, the acceptance ratio? It's maybe two to one. It's not as stringent as the summer program. Uh, we, want, we look for people that are, if we're a nonprofit, we're a nonprofit organization. Uh, we're funded by Google, Cisco, Nokia, Autodesk, uh, and we're hosted at NASA. Right? And our aim is when we're selecting uh, students, whether it's for the graduate or the executive program, who is most likely to take this learning and do something with it? Right? So um, we did uh, in November uh, as a trial a one week program in Brazil where we flew down half our faculty and a box of DVDs. And we did one lecture live, one lecture by videotape, and then Q&A live to see how it worked. And what they did was, the first thing the students did was build a 3D printer. Um, okay. Based on what they learned? No, they, we brought a kit down, yeah. and they put it together on the first day uh, with Dan, who's our head of faculty over there. And then they used it for the rest of the week to print out different things. Now, one of the interesting attributes of this printer is the first, when you put it together, the first thing you print are the last 20% of the parts to finish the printer. Okay? And today you have 3D printers that can print 70% of the parts, right? You've heard that quote. So it's, it's a very exciting uh, field. Um, so those are, that's a little bit about SU. Let me go through some of the major uh, uh, areas that we find interesting. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, neuroscience, and then we're going to close. So there's a whole movement called the makers. And you should all be aware of this, because this is going to expand very quickly. Um, Peter has a very good quote. He says, the day before a major breakthrough, everybody thinks you're crazy, right? until you actually see it happen. And so there's a new breed of, uh, of this is what's called a fabrication lab. 
where you can go to a local area, a local shop and machine things and make things and 3D print things and weld things. And there's a whole breed of people that are just making things. And they come and exhibit it uh, in Silicon Valley every summer. And you have about 800 exhibits of people that have just made things. So this is a fellow who's taken a remote-controlled aircraft. You can take any remote-controlled aircraft and turn it into a drone for $24. Okay. And a drone, an, uh, an automated uh, observance vehicles for surveillance. Okay. Now that's cheap, but it's also kind of frightening. That means anybody can turn their remote control helicopter or plane into a drone. Okay. Um, it used to cost millions of dollars to take high resolution images of the Earth. And these guys created a kit that for $800 you can float up, float up your balloon and take very high resolution images of the Earth for about $800. With a printer? Why do you need the printer for that? You don't. It's just, that's just a balloon. <laughs> no, no. These are just different, uh, different inventions that we've found kind of interesting. So when you can get incredibly high res photographs for that inexpensively, it enables lots of other things. Okay? Uh, this is a fellow who's built in a self-driving uh, car. He wanted me to test drive this. I said no. Um, um, look at all the kit he's got on. It's a little scary. This is a solar power charging station, which they're looking to deploy in Africa and other places so that it's self-contained. Self um, 3D printing is a totally exploding area. Two very interesting developments are first, uh, we are, they're now fabricating nutrients and food. Okay. So you put inject into the printer different flavors and you can fabricate food. Okay. And the second major breakthrough, I don't know if I have this here, is that uh, you can now um, 3D print metal alloys. Okay. And the ability to 3D print and fabricate metal is completely transformational. Okay. This will really change the world. Okay. And these used to cost... Uh, Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Today, that one, that printer is about $800. Um, these are a whole bunch of different things in biotech. Uh, uh, there's a whole movement called DIY bio, where you can hack DNA and genes at home or in your garage. Right? You have analysis tools, a lab on a chip. Uh, this is something to analyze DNA. And in food production, you're know, getting the ability to grow food on walls. Um, traditional farming is very, very inefficient. Okay. So uh, when you have uh, horizontal farming, 85% of the water goes to waste. Right. And that's a big deal. And so if you can do it this way, it's much, much more efficient. Um, this is a diagram. This is a, just a picture of a fellow who's built a, does a nutrition, nutritional supplement called spirulina. It's uh, green, horrible stuff, but it's very good for you. Um, it's like the modern-day equivalent of spinach. Um, he built a, a self-sustaining model where this will generate a day's worth of, for a family, a day's worth of spirulina on a recurring self-generated basis. Right? And so that's a very easy way of keeping your family nutritionally healthy, if not, if not very happy about it. Uh, this is a diagram I like a lot. This looks at the use of nutritional supplements, like vitamin C or copper or fish oil, and it shows, uh, scaling upwards, how much scientific evidence there is for this. So there's lots of evidence for fish oil, green tea, omega-3, uh, not so much for vitamin... For, for what? For nutritional for value. Yeah. Nutritional value. Yeah. Okay. So there's lots of scientific evidence of the nutritional value of folic acid or fish oil. Less so for copper or ginseng, etc. I just think the visualization is very interesting, right? There's a, there's a nice uh, viewpoint there. Uh, this is the fabrication of human organs. So what they do is they put a cartilage onto a mouse and using stem cells grow an ear and then they attach it to somebody that's lost an ear. Okay? This is uh, where they're growing a heart. Uh, using 3D printing, they're at the point today where they can, they can print heart valves. Right? Not the full heart, but the valves. Very, uh, very thoroughly. So very quickly, the estimate will be able to print uh, properly complex organs. The kidney is still very experimental. 
Uh, but think within about 10 or 15 years, we'll be able to fully with, print it. With whose cells do they print it? With your your own. Cells? Yeah. They grow them? They took, take your own stem cells and you grow them. Pluripotent stem cells. Okay. Um, in robotics, these two things I found very interesting. This is a set of small pucks that are, cell, there's no centralized control. They're a mesh, peer-to-peer -peer mesh system. And they're forming themselves into the shape of a logo here. But there's no centralized control. Each, right? one central each one's logo. operating only peer to peer, seeing where they are relative to each other. And once one one of them finds a spot, then they all arrange themselves. A very interesting system. Like a football game. It's like a football game. Okay. And they manage them. They self. Uh, they manage themselves. You can look on YouTube and search for Leonardo Robot, and this is quite a um, an interesting video. I won't play the, the play it here, but if you, you can go search for it. But this, this little robot does two very interesting things. The first is it will detect emotion. It, will detect, it can distinguish between sad or happy. And the second, and more interesting, is can, it will display emotion. Now, at the moment, it's very rudimentary. It's binary. It's sad or happy. Right? And if you show him something angry, he will, he will go like this. Right? But if you think about how that will develop... That's not much different from what we are. Our emotions are essentially subroutines running in the brain, right? So as you get more sophisticated with this, what's the difference? What's the difference between that and a human being, or that and a six-month-old baby, which can essentially do the same thing? Right? Um, the, the biology. Yes, for the moment. <laughs> right. um, and this was the one that I think is one of the most underreported stories. Uh, how many of you have seen this thing about, noticed this about six months ago on synthetic life? So Craig Venter, who sequenced the first human genome, um, for the first time, they've injected uh, DNA into a bacteria. And for the first time in the history of the world, we have a self-replicating bacteria, a life form, whose parent DNA is a computer. And this is probably one of the most important milestones in the history of humanity, is that we've taken out the, the uh, replicating life away from biology and put it into information technology. And does, did um, Singularity University have anything to do with this? No. But, <laughs> yeah. We're, uh, but we know Craig very well, and he, he uh, came and spoke two years ago, and, and so we follow it very closely. So there is so much happening everywhere. We don't have we we don't do what we do is more uh, aggregate all of these interesting things together. Uh, we don't do pure research on our own. Right? But what we found is um, if you can marry marry this idea with the future of nanotechnology or the future of AI, the possibilities become quite frightening. Right? In this particular area, we've we've learned very well how to read DNA. Right? And essentially, if you think about IT, you read, you process, you write. Right? If we've learned how to read DNA very efficiently. And now we're just starting to learn how to write DNA, which is this part of it. That part of it is still slow, but as that evolves... So I grew up programming these PCs. Right? Um, uh, uh, your age has grown up programming the Internet. Your kids will be programming life. Okay? They're going to hack the, the family dog. <laughs> right. So, just be ready for that, and think about how you're going to manage that. Right. Start now. Okay. All right. A um, couple of things. I've I've been really interested in the brain. So what I've done here is I've picked a particular vertical, and I've looked into it a little bit and thought about where I would go with this. So I'm going to talk through this a little bit. About how many of you have seen this image before? Some of you have seen it. Okay. So for those of you who haven't seen it, it looks like a bunch of spots, but actually there's a dog here. So the dog is pointing this way with its head to the ground. This is the ground. That's the head. That's the left ear. This is the left leg, the body, the back leg. Right? Everybody see it now? Does anybody not see it? Okay. Here's the weird part about this. There's no real dog. Well, the, there's the image of a dog is in there, but the key is that your brain, this is a permanent one-way learning that can't be reversed. For the rest of your lives, when you see this image, you will see the dog. And we, have no idea, and we have no idea how this happens. We don't understand how the brain does this. We, in one shot, have a permanent 
non-transferable way of, of implementing an image such that that will always happen, right? So neuroscience is interesting. Uh, it's one of these areas, I think of it as a stack. It's like the OSI model, right? Where you have a physical layer all the way up to the transport layer. We have a similar thing in neuroscience. We have a, at the bottom, you have the DNA, um, then you have neurons and local circuit, the systems of neurons, and finally behavioral aspects of the brain. So we thought, we, the neuroscientists got quite excited because they thought, wow, the, the model actually maps on and maybe the brain really works like a computer. Um, but it turns out there's some issues here. Now you have classes of primary emotions like happiness, surprise, sadness, and then background emotions like ha uh, sadness or um, uh, calmness or pain or pleasure. Right? And so we thought maybe we're on our way to really understanding this. And there's a few people that are trying to build a brain. So there's a fellow called Dharmendra Moda at IBM um, who's actually modeling in software uh, different neurons and doing it from the, from the bottom up, trying to replicate the functioning of a brain neuron by neuron. Right? And so he's trying to, this is 88 brain regions that he's tried to map, and he's adding more and more complexity to it as, he goes, as time goes by. Is he, is, he, um, is he building the program of the brain? No. He's trying to model what's happening in the neurons and then hoping to, hoping to have an emergent view of what happens in the brain. Okay? So the, to predict future, to predict brain, all the time. It's really, to, it's really to understand. He's doing it through it's really to understand. You know, he's got a whole lab. Uh, there's a big area in IBM that's devoted to this. Um, ben Gertzel, who's one of our speakers at SU, is coming top down. He's looked at the brain in terms of different functions. Um, a mind database, sensor processing, language processing, pattern mining, goal and feeling refinement, schema learning. And he's, and he's trying to model in software each of these areas. And his hope is if he can model each of these areas, then essentially you replicate the functions of a brain if you don't replicate the brain. Right? Mm -hmm. So very different uh, viewpoint. He's, he's focused on what's called uh, strong or uh, strong AI. So today, all artificial intelligence is what's called narrow AI. It's focused on a very specific function, like your anti-lock braking in your car, or the page rank algorithm, uh, or the fuzzy logic in your camera to keep it steady. Right? It's very, very focused. Uh, strong AI looks at general. There's what's called AGI, or artificial general intelligence, which is, OK, I know that's a remote control, and I know it's a remote control no matter which way I, I, I turn it. Right? Yeah, which is harder for a computer to figure out. So he's looking at this from a very top-down point of view. Um, one of our students this last summer, um, one of Ronan's classmates, is taking a very basic organism. This is 302 neurons of, uh, of a worm. And he's replicating all of the neurons in software and trying to replicate all of the, everything that's happening in software in that organism and hoping to learn from that. Now the problem is, uh, this is taking a, a supercomputer and a lot of cycles to try and do, and this is only 300 neurons. Okay? Uh, each of you has about 100 billion neurons in your brain, so this, we're a long ways away from understanding. Now, the bad news is the following. The bad news is, whereas the, the good news was we think the brain operates like a computer. A, a, a neuron either fires or it doesn't fire. It's actually binary, right? So we thought, oh, maybe, the, and if we had this stack model, then maybe we can operate a computing model. The problem is, while you, we do know quite a little bit, quite a lot about the functional aspects of the brain, we know that if we poke this area of the brain, my left arm will do this, and if we poke over here, then I'll feel sad, etc. When you talk to the researchers down at the neuron level about what makes a neuron fire or not fire, they have absolutely no idea. At the chemistry. At the at the actual electrical impulse yeah. level of what's happening in brain fire. So it turns out that every neuron out of the hundred billion that you have. Exactly. takes as input about from 10,000 other neurons and then outputs to 10,000 other neurons. So it's the worst many-to-many -many complex system that you've ever seen. And it rewrites its own microcode on the fly. <laughs> Each neuron operates as a, as a supercomputer in its own right. So we are very, very far from really understanding it. So that's the bad news. The good news is we actually don't need to understand it very well. We don't need to understand fully. We just have to interface Replication. properly with it. Replication means you have to understand it. Right? Because if you're going to try and replicate something, yeah, exactly. Functions. But functions we, even. We but actually, we can try and understand. For example, this is Bernoulli's principle, which governs lift in an yeah. aircraft. 
We still don't know really how Bernoulli's principle works. But it hasn't stopped us from engineering the hell out of it to have airplanes that will work reliably, etc. Right? So our hope is that in the brain we do something similar. I've lost an image there. But and interact and interface effectively with it. Okay? So all styles of influencing or interacting with the brain are brands. Right? So brands, what do they do? They try and create an emotional response in you. And that gets wired into your emotional system. So every time you see a Coke, you feel happy. Right? Or you want one. So they try and create a vertical um, uh, a hook into your brain. The masters of this are religions. Mm -hmm. Religions are essentially master branding me mechanisms. Right? They take a young kid whose neocortex hasn't fully formed lot, thought, lot, and then you put in ideological ideas and use replication or repetition to ingrain that idea. And what's it's in there? You can't get it out. You can't un-engineer or reverse engineer uh, branding religion. Think about when you see your local sports team play, there's an emotional response in you that's very powerful. Right? And that's just a sports team, very, very minor. So we have a lot of work to do in trying to understand how the brain manages and works with emotion. Now we're making a lot of progress. This is a, a chip put directly onto the motor cortex. Uh, and you, they have patients now that can manage a wheelchair just with their thoughts. So that's very exciting. Um, and this is a whole uh, interfacing mechanism with, uh, with the brain. Um, and somewhere here, whether I have it or not, I may have it, but what, what we've got is this is a very crude level. Where we're getting to is we're getting to the point where you have nanowires that are very, very thin that could insert by all of the capillaries, blood capillaries in your brain and interface directly with your neurons. And so very soon in your lifetimes, you have the ability to reprogram your brain however you want. <laughs> and the question is, what will you do with it? Right? So you, I think you should start thinking about that now. So we have different ways. This is biofeedback. This is MRI. We have a, a field called fMRI, which is functional uh, imaging. Right? Where you can, and we have actually one of our researchers has a lab. I think that's a photograph of it, where he does real time fMRI. So you lie down in an MRI machine. And he tells you, think about lifting your left arm. And he can map exactly which neurons are firing in your brain okay, in real time. Um, now, this is the field that's really freaking me out. Now, I see lots of really cool stuff, so it takes a lot to freak me out. Okay? So this is uh, some, a field called optogenetics. And this is, again, a, a mixture of genetics, virology, and optics, three very different fields that are now intersecting. What they've done here is they've used a virus to distribute into the brain of a mouse a new type of neuron. Okay? And this type of neuron happens to be, what they've done is engineer a neuron that happens to be very sensitive to light. So if you shine a light on it, the neuron will fire. So they can force the firing of a neuron in this case. So you use the virus to distribute this, this, uh, this neuron in the brain of the mouse. Now in this case, this was funded by the Dalai Lama. And they, just, just, you, they put it in the part of the brain where compassion Six. Okay. What is Kimla. compassion? Kimla. 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 Okay. So um, what they do then is once they put the brain and the neurons into the, into the mouse, they put an optical fiber into the brain of the mouse and turn on the switch. And the, brain, the mouse becomes totally compassionate and overly compassionate. Now this is quite scary. If you extrapolate that out, you have mind control over the internet. Um, and this is live in mice today. What does it mean with compassion? Like it was, hey, It just becomes very friendly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If, for example, there's a certain thing on a cat, with yeah. him, and he's near a mouse. So you want to attack the cat, you want to attack the mouse, you look yes. the case? Yes. <laughs> right. Or if you took a, uh, a cat and put it in your other, on another cat, and, and put those neurons in the part of the brain that says attack, <laughs> it will attack the other guy. Right? It's full mind control over the internet. Now imagine, imagine that you distribute into the brain different neurons that respond to different light frequencies. Right? By, tr by, by broadcasting into the brain different light frequencies, you can have different neurons fire. 
Okay. And the implications are, are roughly infinite. Yeah. Theoretically speaking, is the technology that's being used on, on the mice, can it be used on humans today? Yes. 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 Because the, the, the genetics of a mouse are about 97%, the same as ours. So if this is live in a mouse today, I think in maybe 8 to 10 years. But do you need, first of all, to have an optical interface? Yeah, you need lots of things to happen. Yeah, and you don't have a single neuron, which is the attack neuron, the passion neuron. No. You have an Olympic system, and you have... Yeah, there's lots of, there's lots of areas, right? But, but once they know, as we interface more with the brain and understand how it works, this becomes more and more uh, eerie. I don't know what the Hebrew word for eerie is. Eerie. Scary. Yeah. Okay. Scary. So this is the area that I find pretty crazy. Now, I've been thinking about how would I apply it. We're at a, we're at a point where we have lots of really... Um, lots of technologies coming together in very exciting ways. We have AI, we have data management, we have cloud computing, we have sensor networks, etc. Where would, where would we apply this? So here are two areas that I'm interested in. One is self-awareness or consciousness. Okay? We don't really know what that is. We don't know what self-consciousness or awareness is. I'm pretty clear I'm self-aware. But I'm not really sure what I'm self-aware. Right? My wife doesn't think I'm very self-aware. <laughs> and so, what does that mean even? Right? When, I've talked to, when I've talked to Dan, who's, who's watched a lot of animals in laboratories, his view is that when you get to the level of a frog, a frog is just about aware that it, it, it exists. Right? About, just, it's just anecdotal. That's his feeling. That's his yeah. feeling. I mean, he's watched for years lots of different animals. A mosquito, in his opinion, a mosquito has no idea that it exists. It's just operating. A frog just about understands that, yes, I exist, I'm a frog. You may not call itself a frog. But, but, right. And then you get more and more linearly more complicated that way. So, but we don't know what that is. We don't know whether consciousness is an emergent property based on complexity, which is the current viewpoint, or whether it's there's an overall consciousness that you get aware of as you get to this level. Okay? So I think that's an area where I'm particular. The second is, is luck. Right? If you look around Silicon Valley or you look at Hollywood, people have to be, to be successful. You have to be very good, you have to work very hard, and then you have to be very lucky. Right? And we're little by little understanding what are the constructs by which luck or serendipity happens, and what if you could create luck. Right? So those are areas that I'm interested in. So, um, Isn't that completely fictional right now? No. Why not? There's what lots of ways to influence you, it. How would you define luck in the uh, in mechanical world? Okay. Uh, I would define it as the ability to influence an external system. Right. If I can influence an external system, then I can essentially have things go my way. So a great athlete. Right? It always looks like they're lucky, but they're not. They have the ability in some very ephemeral way to influence the external system. Right? So how do you do that? Now, we're learning little by little how to measure that. So um, not necessarily just outliers, but for example, we have uh, quantum event generators. We think today that the brain operates using quantum mechanics. They've now determined, by the way, the photo photosynthesis. In plants, it uses quantum mechanics. That leaves room for God. It does leave room for God. Right. Barely. Barely. Um, but it's possible. Barely. Yeah. Are we doing on time? We have five minutes? <laughs> okay. So let me pause there. I've been, we've run it kind of as a discussion. Any, any questions that you folks have? Yeah. I noticed SEO was founded in the midst of what is referred to as the worst financial crisis since 29. Yeah. Was it despite the crisis or was the crisis a contributing factor? It was very much despite the crisis. As the guy who helped create the organization, it was very much despite the crisis. It was a very uh, difficult thing. Now, uh, the crisis also highlighted for us that, that this kind of thing, whether it's the earthquake in Japan, whether it's... Uh, uh, other phenomena that we're going to see or the disturbance we're seeing all around the Middle East that this type of, of disruption is going to happen more and more right? and this very dramatic disruption is going to happen more and more and so we need mechanisms to be able to deal with very uh, systemic disruption at a deep scale and so we don't have that today okay. yeah 
Uh, you said that there are exponential growth for the technology. Yeah. Well, we keep a fast and uh, uh, in this way, <laughs> like uh, 20 years, we have technology which uh, becomes new every uh, few seconds or minutes. Yes. And that's quite impossible. Yes. So uh, how can you promise the, the rate should uh, stay the same? So the best analogy that I've come up for that, and it's, it's my personal analogy, is I think of it like a, like a thermodynamic state change, right? So think about water. You have molecules that have a certain restricted range of motion. You heat up the water, the interactions become more and more uh, frequent and closer together, more dense. You get more and more activity. And what happens is molecules start escaping and you transition from water into steam. Right? So you have a complete state change in the substance. And I think that's what happens. What we don't know is what's the state change that we go into. Because if you're sitting there as a water molecule, you have no idea you're going to be launched off into, the, into space. Right? And your world changes completely. And actually, that's what Ray calls the singularity. Right? The, part, the idea of a singularity or a black hole is that as a mathematical construct past which you can't predict what happens. And we see that in many ways. And the iPhone arriving was kind of a singularity in a sense because everything changed after that. And so the, uh, an example in business and economics, that it took all of history to create the first billion-dollar company, which was in the 1940s. It took about 30 years to create the next billion-dollar company, 15 years to create the next one. Google took about seven years. Facebook took about four years. Uh, Groupon, if you're familiar with the new, the new model, took eight months to get to a billion-dollar company. Okay? So that metabolism is increasing dramatically. And how, far, how much faster can it get? Right? So that's, we, we think about that a lot. We don't know the answer to that. Here. One last question. Last question. Make it a good one. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. What do you think the leading industry in 20, 50, 1,000 years will be? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's easy. It's, it'll be information technology. Because little by little, we're, we're information enabling the whole world, right? And so understanding and managing IT will be fundamental to everything. It will probably become the biggest industry in the world, easily. Um, now, whether that's a good or bad thing is a separate issue. We have billions of geeks running around trying to manage servers, but that's a, little, that's a good problem to have opposed to different, uh, some of the things we have today. Our basic idea is we've got some pretty big challenges and right now, if we don't solve clean water or public health or climate change, if we don't solve these using technology, we're going to end up in war. Right? And war is a very expensive way of progressing humanity. And we've used technology many times in the past. It's the ROI on using technology to progress humanity. That's always the way to progress best. So with that, let me close that off. Thank you for some of the great questions.
טוב, תלמידים מכירים, תישארו פה שנייה לעוד שתי הודעות. תישארו פה, שתי הודעות.